If you clicked on this video, you either have an iPad Pro or are considering getting one. And chances are you're thinking about getting one for video editing. Well, I'm here to tell you about my experience using the iPad Pro for video editing, what's worked for me and what hasn't. This review will be broken down into multiple parts. I'll have them here and their timestamps on screen so you can jump around to them if you need. Design and build quality. When it comes to the design of the iPad, I don't know how you could get much better than this, to be honest. Everything about the product just feels premium and very well thought out. The buttons are in great places, everything feels like it's exactly how it should, especially during the process of editing. If you were keeping up with any of the marketing when this product was released, you'll probably be aware of how thin it is, and I can attest this product is stupidly thin. And when I say stupid, I mean that in a sense of it's amazing, and it's also a negative aspect in a very minor way. The only reason I say it's negative is because of the fact that it's so light you need a case. And I'll get to this later on, but I also seriously recommend getting an external SSD, which adds weight. All of this to say, when you're holding it in one hand and editing with another, after a while it gets heavy just because the case, the SSD, all that weight is directed right on your wrist, and obviously it depends on how you hold it and what your environment's like, but that is a consideration if you're on the go a lot. Small nitpick though, again, this aspect is all dependent on your own circumstances. Display and screen real estate. Now I only have the 12.9 inch model, I don't have the 11 inch model. I can't speak to that experience. But with the 12.9 inch model, it's great for video editing. And that includes other types of editing as well. I use Affinity Designer, Photo, and Publisher on the iPad also. So all of this space makes plenty of room for access to the tools that you need and all that. Color accuracy is awesome. While for the regular day-to-day -day YouTube stuff, I don't nitpick my color accuracy, but for client-based stuff, then yeah, I'll pay more attention. One really neat feature of the iPad Pro is what's called reference mode, where if you go to display, advanced, and then reference mode. Reference mode is where the colors are calibrated for absolute accuracy. It's meant for professional content creation, so if you think you could benefit from that, that's a plus. Another thing that's awesome, and is really easy to forget about once you get used to it, is what Apple refers to as ProMotion. ProMotion is just 120 hertz. It's a feature that Apple products have had for a while, but in the course of content creation, it's really nice. It's not necessary, but nice. And once you get used to it, you sort of forget that it's there. Again, not necessary, but nice to have. Performance under the hood. So how's that M4 chip? Is it everything Apple promised? This is what I'm gonna tell you. It chews through 6K B-RAW footage. You can load up footage in Resolve, make a timeline from that footage, and it plays back no problem. I personally wouldn't recommend trying to color grade that footage, or at least not putting a super heavy color grade on that footage, because then it's definitely gonna stutter. So keep that in mind. If you were to try to use proxies, you might have a better time playing back color graded footage, but also if you're trying to color grade, you shouldn't be using proxies anyways. So probably better just use a normal computer for that. Overall, DaVinci Resolve plays back everything super smoothly. I've had no experiences where footage simply doesn't play, and that's my honest experience. I also wanna know that I commonly layer footage. I'm often using two layers to cut back and forth between screen recording and 6K B-RAW footage of myself while I'm recording my YouTube videos. So take that as you will. Next up in this category, thermal management. The iPad does get hot. There's just no way around that. It doesn't get like hot to the touch. I just wanna make that clear. It gets on the upper side of warm. I personally won't sit down to edit with the iPad for more than an hour on the extreme side, but most of the time it's in 15 to 20 minute stints. The most common time frame for me to edit is on the breaks at my job where I can sit for 15 minutes and just bang out some progress on an edit. Workflow in DaVinci Resolve. The touch aspect of editing in DaVinci Resolve on the iPad is pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie to you. When I first seriously picked up the app and realized how capable it actually was, the touch aspect was transformational with regard to how I viewed editing. There's two buttons that you're most commonly gonna press while in Resolve, cut and ripple cut. I'll explain. When you get the app, it's gonna default to only providing you with the cut page and the color page. From what I'm aware of as of 2025, Blackmagic still doesn't officially support any of the other pages, but they're still available via keyboard shortcuts in the keyboard shortcuts menu. I have mine set up so that they stay available whenever I open the app. With this in mind though, I really only use the edit page. I haven't ever really used the cut page to be honest, even on the computer. I prefer to have the controls that come with the edit page. With that in mind, the little scissors icon that display cut and the right click menu that pops up and gives you the option for ripple cut are the most commonly used buttons I interact with. For context, the right click menu isn't click based on the iPad, obviously. To access this menu, you have to hold down on what you want the menu for and it'll pop up. This goes for use of the Apple Pencil as well. Speaking of the Apple Pencil, I use it often. I hardly ever use DaVinci Resolve on iPad without it. It's nice because it gives precise touch on the UI. Like for example, when moving the divider line between video and audio tracks, my thick fat finger doesn't hardly grab onto it. The fine tip point of the Apple Pencil makes scenarios like that nice. 
Also, context menus like the timeline creation menus are nice to have the Apple Pencil in. Contact on the screen is a little more just precise. But I want to emphasize that it's not necessary. You could just as well edit with your finger. User experience and ergonomics. So the user experience is pretty straightforward. The touch gestures integrated into the workflow that comes with this app is really straightforward. Pinch to zoom on the timeline is almost all that you need to know. Clip trimming is also super straightforward. It works the same way as it does on a computer. You select the clips and using your finger or the Apple Pencil, trim them in the direction you want. So the user experience is awesome. The responsiveness is snappy and quick, but now let's talk about ergonomics. Remember how I talked about weight being directed onto your wrist? For extended periods of time, it sucks. I'm not gonna lie. But I don't think that this device is meant to be a device where you edit for long periods of time on. This device is meant to be used for a quick edit here and there. Spare 15 minutes, edit. So that's definitely a negative for me, at least. Color grading. For color grading, this thing rocks. I will say as a disclaimer, I don't color grade often with it, but I do color grade. Here's my workflow. Oftentimes, I'll create a power grade on my PC and then just apply that power grade to my footage on my iPad if I even do any color grading on the iPad at all. It depends on the project, but I will say that color grading works and it works great. You're obviously gonna get the iPad version of the color page, so it's not the full UI presentation that you're used to on a computer, but the iPad version of the color page is amazing. The fact that they were able to port the page onto an iPad is an achievement in and of itself. And I know I said earlier that I wouldn't really recommend trying to color grade 6K B-Raw footage and expecting it to play back smoothly, especially if you had a heavy color grade, but that's not to say you can't work on a 1080p timeline, if that makes sense. Audio editing. Here's where I have to show some tough love. I believe this is mostly attributed to Blackmagic's development, but audio editing is very limited. And by limited, I mean there's nothing that you can do on the track level that I'm aware of. There's this bug where the mixer is just not visible, like at all. You can see it's been shoved up against the side of the UI, but I haven't found anything that lets me pull it out and make it visible like other windows in the application. It's because of this problem that for all audio processing, I'll pick up whatever project I'm working on on my PC and add all of the audio processing there. On 99% of my projects, all of the audio that needs processing is on a single track. And it's usually just like me talking exactly like you're hearing right now. So it makes more sense to do it on a track level. So that's my take. Other than that, there's still the other regular audio effects. I personally don't use them though. Until I can get my mixer and track base effects, I don't have anything to do with audio editing on iPad on DaVinci Resolve. Another thing that I want to mention is that I tried using Apple AirPods to edit with twice, and twice I didn't like it. There's a very noticeable delay in playback, and since then I'll just make sure I have a relatively quiet space to work in so that I can play my sound out loud. Battery life and power management. Battery life on the iPad Pro with DaVinci Resolve isn't bad. It's really not bad at all. But here's what I'll tell you. If you plan on editing for an hour or more, you should plan on recharging overnight because battery charge level does deteriorate a noticeable amount even in a 15 minute window. It's not a bad amount, but enough to notice usually. In my battery tab on my iPad settings, over the past 10 days, it says DaVinci Resolve has used 22% of my iPad's battery on average, so take that as you will. Storage and connectivity. I'll be completely honest with you, the model of iPad you get doesn't really matter with regards to storage and connectivity. I'm going to go over this more in the accessories and add-on section, and you'll understand why then, but it really doesn't matter. Personally, I have the lowest storage option with the only Wi-Fi connectivity, and that's fine enough for me for two reasons. With regards to connectivity, Wi-Fi is perfect because to be honest, I'm not really gonna work anywhere that doesn't have a Wi-Fi connection. My two main places that I'm at all the time are work and home, both of which have stellar Wi-Fi. Thanks to this, I can access my entire library of assets, such as stock footage and music that I store on my Google Drive, straight from Resolve for iPad. And in the event that I'm not near Wi-Fi and I need those assets, I can wait a few hours to get to where I'm going and then I'll have internet access. But let's say you have your video assets that you want to edit locally available, but don't have access to Wi-Fi. Never a problem, as DaVinci Resolve's project database system works exactly the same on iPad as it does on a computer. You'll always have access to a local project library. That's nice. Personally, what I do is I pay Blackmagic's $5 monthly fee to have a project library in the cloud. So I'll start a project on the cloud, work on it on my iPad from wherever I'm at, just because I have Wi-Fi 99% of the time. And when it's time to work on audio processing, like I mentioned earlier, I could just pick up that same project on my laptop or PC right where I left off on my iPad. It's extremely convenient and it makes that $5 worth it every time. If you're always on the go like I am or just don't wanna sit in your office all day to get work done, this is an absolute, and I cannot stress this enough, game changer from a productivity perspective. To summarize this section, connectivity doesn't matter all the time with regards to your ability to work on Resolve, but it surely doesn't matter on the iPad if you have access to Wi-Fi often. No need to pay Apple a crazy markup for a cellular connectivity. Accessories and add-ons. Now this is where the fun is. There's five main accessories that I use with the iPad Pro. I'm gonna break down each one for you. 
Let's start with the case. For the case, I don't actually use the Magic Keyboard from Apple. While the keyboard looks great, I ended up going in an alternative route for a few reasons. First, I wanted to be able to remove the iPad from the keyboard and still have a case on it. Can't do this with the Apple Magic Keyboard. Second, the keyboard is very stiff in its form factor, somewhat tall also. I like to work on my couch often, and given that my lap is not as flat and as stiff as a tabletop or a desk, I can't imagine having such a high center of gravity would make for a great workflow. So what do I actually have? I have the Logitech Combo Touch Keyboard, and I prefer this one because it allows me to remove the iPad from the keyboard while still maintaining a protective cover on it. The kickstand on the back isn't quite as solid, so it allows for flexibility when laying on a couch, tabletop, etc. works for me. I will say that with regards to DaVinci Resolve, I don't use the keyboard. The only times I use the keyboard are to add or remove in and out points, as the shortcuts are the same on iPad version of Resolve as they are on the desktop version. The second accessory, the Apple Pencil. As I mentioned earlier, the pencil isn't necessary, it's just nice to have because it allows you a very precise control over what you're trying to touch. Now if you're working in Procreate, that's an entirely different story, and there's no way to use Procreate without an Apple Pencil. But this video is about DaVinci Resolve, and I'll tell you that while it's nice to have, it is in fact not necessary. The third accessory I use the most is this little adhesive pouch that I've attached to the back of the case on my iPad. It's perfect for holding the next two accessories so that I can keep all of my things together. Speaking of those next two accessories, the fourth one is this external Samsung SSD. It's a 1TB T5 model that I use. I also have the T7 model, I just haven't busted it out yet to use it, but this is great because I'll record from my Blackmagic camera straight to this, screen record from my PC to its own local storage, and then add that screen recording to this SSD and the Blackmagic footage to the PC storage. This way I have two copies of both clips, and I can open up the project on either my iPad or PC and be completely caught up. What makes having the SSD so nice is that I don't need to pay Apple hundreds of more dollars for more internal storage. I can just pay Amazon hundred bucks and have another terabyte of storage this way. And finally, I have this little cloth hand glove so that I don't get unwanted touches on my screen when I'm resting my hand across it because the screen is decently sized. Almost an entire 13 inches diagonally, you're bound to get some unwanted touches from time to time, and while this accessory is more practical in Procreate, it depends on where you're laying or where you're sitting as to how often you get unwanted touches. Reliability and Stability In terms of reliability and stability, I really only have one gripe, and I suspect that this is more of an iOS problem than a Resolve for iPad problem, but when you're in the middle of an edit and you have a timer that goes off, there's this glitch where your sound goes off completely. A triggered timer kills all of your sound. So now when I'm editing on my break, I'll set a timer on my watch or my phone instead of the iPad because sometimes I'm in the middle of a sentence that I need to finish. So I'll finish that sentence, get my thoughts in, and then be on my way when the timer on my phone goes off. Best use case and target audience. So I've already touched on this a few times already, but the best use case for DaVinci Resolve on iPad is for the editor on the go the editor who has a lot of projects to work on and a lot of places to be. If you don't mind sitting in an office or your computer all the time you work on your edits, wherever that computer may be, then perhaps the iPad isn't for you. But I use the iPad all the time for various different things and there's almost nothing I can't do. The audio editing still needs some work in terms of development, but as I was saying, almost everything. Price and value proposition. Before we even decide whether or not the system has value to you, let's discuss price. The same system that I'm using in total costs $2,171. It's a pretty steep price, I know. So if you don't feel that you can benefit from owning the system, I would perhaps consider sticking to the office computer. The first step to understanding whether or not you can gain from the system is asking yourself, how much money do you stand to gain on a regular basis from this system? Do you have the discipline or the means of creating a business with the system? If you think so, then I would personally recommend going for it. Summary and conclusion. All right, so after digging through all of these details, here's the bottom line. If you're craving an editing setup that keeps up with your day-to-day, -day, the iPad Pro is shockingly capable. DaVinci Resolve on iPad handles heavy footage like 6K B-RAW super well, and that alone is pretty mind-blowing. The whole touch base workflow plus the option to use an Apple Pencil makes editing on a tablet feel dare I say, almost fun. That said though, it's not all sunshine, especially when it comes to the audio editing. The mixer just isn't there, which might drive you a little nuts if you rely on track level effects. And sure, carrying around an external SSD, a case, and some random accessories from here and there can get a bit heavy, so ergonomics do factor in. Even so, for me, the mobility is totally worth it. I love that I can whip out the iPad during a break at work or on the couch and slice together an edit. If you do see yourself needing a more robust setup for color grading or audio though, you'll probably want a more traditional computer. But for quick editing sessions and a flexible workflow, the iPad Pro definitely pulls its weight, and then some. In the end, is it a perfect replacement for a full-blown desktop? Probably not. But if convenience, portability, and the ability to edit from practically anywhere speak to you, then I'd say the iPad Pro is absolutely worth considering.